couldn't get the function to sign, it's such a busy part. Uh, we've had a couple of presentations in here, and it's actually worked out right. We've got the screen going. Um, yeah, so the paper from Noel's going to stand up there, hope you can all hear it, and we're video videoing it for the, for the website. Because um, basically, um, I think a lot of the stuff that we're doing now, um, you need to have your wits about you in the hills. And um, every time I go into Tararua's, it just teaches you who's boss. And I've had a couple of situations recently where I was overconfident. And it, it really kicked you in the ass if you, if you let it, the New Zealand wilderness. Um, and it, a lot of the stuff you are going to do it comes down by making your own mistakes and intuition. So the um, thing being, we're lucky enough to have Noel Bigwood here tonight. He's a very experienced uh, search and rescue person. He's worked with the police, I think, from the 19th, since 1977. Or I've been in search and rescue since 77. Since 77. So he's he's seen a lot, and he's seen the, the decades go by and the people going into terror. He's got a lot of experience. So I'm sure it's going to be really valuable to have his experience and people, the people you see in the news, I reckon a lot of the time the people have made one or two crucial errors in what they've done or the decisions they've made um, that were avoidable. So that's the key thing, right? If we're going to be doing this stuff, we really should make every effort to, to plan our trips and think about what we're doing and um, really, really concentrate and never, ever take it too lightly. But at the same time, don't, don't not do it because you're too, you know, it's too big. But I've, I've had a few situations where I've just been overcoming and I've, and I've, re and I felt I've, I've, I'm still learning and I've done quite a lot. But to have um, someone like Noel just give you some theory, then you can go away, have a think about it, um, and think about what stuffs in your gear your decision making in certain situations that could really help you if you do get into the big country and you are in a situation. Because what happens is you get one or two situate things that go on top of each other and then suddenly you're in a bit, a bit of a problem. But So I'll hand it over to Noel. Um, yeah, so thanks for coming in Noel and um, I'll leave it here. Howdy. As he said, I've been in search and rescue Western Tararua since 1977. So I've helped one or two people out. If you're going to get in trouble, it's best to do it in the Western Tararua's, north of Renata Ridge. There are no episodes of them missing in our patch. <laughs> However, there have been a few bodies brought out. We always find them, they're not always alive. So, I'm here tonight to try and help you avoid the need for these guys. Next one, please. Don't want you to be carted around in a stretcher by a group of ugly men. Right. Or need these fellas. Or these fellas, except that aircraft won't rescue you anymore. Why? That was its last ever search and rescue operation. It's been replaced by the great big NH-90, which is a fantastic truck, but not a very good bumblebee. That, yeah, that was the Iroquois' last ever operational search. So I was um, ops controller for that event. It was called Operation Fender. Come on in, have a seat. And involved a uh, European tourist who carried a guitar along TRI. Okay. I don't run. So I don't have full understanding of you guys. I do a bit of walking and a bit of prevention work. Anybody seen them? You know what it is? Is it a trail map? 
Yeah, yeah it's a trail marker. It's one of a set about 700 metres long and it runs from Kaim Hut to Judd Ridge, which is the route to Otaki Forks. That one there, I can tell from it that I'm facing towards the hut. There's the red bit on it is a reflector. If I was facing Otaki Forks, it would be white. So if you're stuck up there in the fog at night and you see a line of red, you can go straight to the hut. Or if you see a line of white, you're heading for Otaki Forks. Is that just that bit or is that standard? That's just that bit. It is definitely not standard. The dock snow poles and the tarauas are average 75 metres apart. These are 20 metres. They're there because of all the operations we had with people getting lost between the hut and the ridge. And the fact that I got a bit more support to do it after the Bennington Jackson deaths. Right. It's nice to get out there. Next please. And go for a bit of a walk in strange foreign lands. That's the highest mountain in South Wales. And that's back in June. Oh, it's got the date stamp on it anyway. But I also found another recreation that's a bit slower than you. And it's the first one that the wife and I both like, apart from walking. Only trouble is you've got to go 12,000 miles to do it because there's nowhere suitable in New Zealand. Right, next please. It's nice to be up there and with your pocket camera get close enough to some deer to get a nice picture. Or next. Get some nice views. Quite a few of you will know that view. And again. Few lesser of you will know that one. But that's another nice one in the Tarauas. Which one's that? That's, yeah, that's Nichols. Looking down the Wahine Valley. That's great, that one. Especially in a storm. Next, please. And it's all right when it's like this. Anybody recognise the view? That's Simpson from right on the main range of the Tarauas. But when it's like that, what does that mean? Next please. Could get a bit like this. Or it could end up like this. First guy's 10 metres from me, second guy's 20 metres from me. If you're up there in the tussock and it's like that, how fast are you going to be able to travel and keep to the trail if we haven't cut it recently? But when it gets like that, he can't come and help you. Helicopters can fly through cloud. The problem is they can't fly the, through the hills in the clouds. So they can't come and help. And you may end up famous like this photo montage was specially prepared for the coroner, Tim Scott after the deaths of Bennington and Jackson near Kaim Hut. They lost their way in a snowstorm whiteout on what is now the pole line between Judd Ridge and Kaim Hut. It's only 700 metres. They ended up 270 degrees off course. And you'll see that magenta arrows B and J that's the ridge to Mungahooka hut whereas they should have been by the other magenta arrow Kaim hut he was as the crow flies about 600 meters from the hut she was 900 
they might as well have been on the other side of the moon. Kind. Yeah. Well, they actually got very close. We found indications that they might have been within 300 metres of the hut. But you'll see where the green track goes round. It appears they've lost that curved round under the words hut mound, come up by the red arrow and ended up going along that ridge. They've camped where her body was found because in the southeasterly where she was is a sheltered spot. But she, looks like she didn't make the night and he didn't make the following morning. Hands up all those that want to end up famous like that. The other thing that'll take you is the rivers. What are the two ways a river will get you? They'll help with that. Drowning by being swept away. If you look at a river and it's up, remember what your mum said on the first date. If in doubt, keep out. There's always a dry way round. It might be a hell of a lot longer, but I've just been to too many cases where people thought, I might get across. When we find them, they're usually only wearing their boots. And they're just dead meat. If a flooded river takes you, that's it. If you've got a full tramping pack on, you've got half a chance in a flooded river. If you haven't got that, you're probably toast. The other thing that you guys in particular have got to watch for in rivers is foot entrapment. If there's only this much water in a river and it's moving reasonably quick and your foot gets trapped and you can't get it out, you're probably going to die. If the cold doesn't get you, just the relentless pressure of the water will eventually overcome you and you'll drown. People have drowned in that much moving water because their foot was trapped. So watch out. If the rocks are too big for your feet, you can get trapped between them, look out. Maybe go back into slightly deeper water that's got smaller shingle in it. The other thing about, it might be nice and shallow going across a rapid, where the river's dug out from a hole and dumped on it, the top of that rapid, that shingle and stones are probably loose. And that's where you may go over. Do you have any tips in terms of the height of the water and the speed? Where you leg, where you go? Yeah, there's um, The, the gui general guidelines we teach are the frog rule. What's a frog do when it's sitting on its lee pond all day? What does it say? Knee deep, knee deep, <laughs> knee deep. And the walking rule. If the river's going faster than you can walk, put those two together. If it's more than D deep and it's more than walking speed, there's one hell of a lot of force there. Now if the water's nice and slow, I don't care if I go up to here. I won't get swept away there. But if I go down where it's fast, that's when I can get swept, swept away, bounce down the rocks, if I bang my head or I bang my tailbone, good night nurse. So, 
knee deep and the walking rule that's the two things the other one's the eye rule what would that apply to if I had a jelly bean I'd give you one Socrates was right if you ask the right questions the audience has got all the answers he's the guy that said the lecture is an outmoded form of learning 329 BC but you're dead right if you can't see the bottom how the hell do you know how deep it is how the, how the hell do you know what you're stepping into if it's dirty that's it it's unknown territory keep out What can you to do to prevent being a famous exhibit at a coroner's court? What can you do as a group? Let everybody know. Walk together. Yeah, go together. This is a finger. It's easily broken. This is a fist. Try and break this. <laughs> if there's a group of you, you're so much stronger. Okay, there'll always be a wee bit of difference. So one or two in the group won't go quite as fast as they would have. And one or two of the group are going to have to work really hard not to hold the others up. But if there's a group of you, you're strong. And if something goes wrong, you've got mutual support with one another. Who's heard of the Aussie band Three Dog Night? Come on, I see a bit of grey hair. Yeah. What does that Aboriginal term mean? Yeah. On an ordinary night, an abo has one of his dogs cuddled up to him to keep him warm. On a cold night, he has two. On a really cold night, he has all three around him. If something goes wrong and you're stuck out there and you can't get out, the best way to keep warm is other people's body heat. If you don't believe me, ask Nicky McDonald. Features editor of the Dominion. She uh, rang me up wanting to duplicate the experience of the mother and daughter from the States who ended up in the bush out the back of Waikanae. So I took her out the bush, in the bush out the back of Waikanae, and we spent a night just in a plastic bag with some ferns under us and some ferns on top of us, and it was a bloody cold night. And I might be old, I might be ugly, I might be smelly, and I might snore, but she certainly appreciated my body heat. <laughs> and I actually appreciated what little she had. So grouping up is a big thing. If you're going in the back country, please don't go by yourself. If you do go by yourself, what can you do for insurance? Tell people where you're going and stick to it. Take a beacon or a tracking device. There's a whole variety there now. Beacons are down to the stage of being about, I think, 120 grams. Um, mine's 230, but its battery lasts twice as long, so I'll stick with it. But it, yeah, if I was a runner, I'd be looking at a little one. There are other things on the market as well. Um, tracking devices, one's called the Spot, 
Another one's called the inReach, and they'll both send tracking signals to satellites. InReach also sends text messages. The problem with those two is there's an ongoing rental cost. You have, like a cell phone, you have to pay for your number. But for search and rescue it can be really handy. Someone rings up, my hubby hasn't come home from his run. I've looked up on the net and the last five dots from his tracker are just south of Mount Crawford. Bingo. Search area has gone from that to this. But as I said, there's an ongoing cost. PLB, there's no ongoing cost and hopefully you never use it. I'm on my third one now. None of them have ever been used. Have there been any cases of spot beacons not getting reception when they've been set off yourself? Yep. Um, the spot and the inreach do not like wet, thick podocarp bush. If you're under a thick, wet canopy, sometimes the signal won't get out. I know uh, we use the inreach at work and generally they track fairly well but sometimes they'll flash for ages you hit a clearing and bingo the signal goes that's when it's really wet and we've got really thick canopy above that spot does under the bush yeah the other thing is because they're reliant on satellites and we're down the bottom of the world it won't necessarily go instantly, particularly if you're in an east-west valley. It's got to wait for the polar orbiting satellite to come over and be within your angle. So they're not instant. A lot of people think EPIRBs are instant. No. They're better uh, these days, but there's still not many satellites there. So they won't always go straight away. And the other thing is, the, the helicopters may not be able to fly. If you've run for six hours into the middle of the Tarours, it might take a search team a day and a half to get to you. We don't move that fast, and we're looking as we go. What else can you do? to prevent becoming a statistic if something goes wrong. Carry good gear. Carry good gear. Yeah. Would you think good gear is one spare thermal top and a water bottle? <laughs> oh, well, um, my son came across a guy all, all he had on was singlet, shorts, spare thermal top tied round his waist and carrying a water bottle at the top of the Mungahooka ladder. He got told to have sex and travel back <laughs> and not go any further. Is your son called Rob? Yeah. Oh, me. <laughs> He was very worried about you. It's good to see you're still alive. I'll tell him. That was 2014, was it? 2013. Yeah. Europe and can't hook, right? Pardon? Europe and can't hook. Here. Here. <laughs> right. But, you know, Rob's, Rob's been in um, search and rescue for approaching 20 years now and he's just seen so many of these cases. Runners are terrible to find. If people haven't got anything to keep them warm, they've got to keep moving. And they move faster than our search teams do. And it's really hard if you're planning the search, you think about the speed they could be moving, You've got to, your area just goes like this. 
<coughs> if there's really good advice about the route, it's not too bad. But that's assuming the person managed to stay on the route. Now someone said carry a thermal blanket. Bag. Who said bag? Hands up everybody that goes for the bag. Right. What's going to take the heat out of you first if you can't move? The wind. The wind. The lady's a genius. Yeah. The wind is the thing. You've got to get out of the wind. If you've got a thermal blanket, it's quite hard to keep the air movement under control. If you're in a bag, you can pull it up and either tighten it here or here, you've got the air movement under control. The ground, you will lose heat to the ground, but the air movement is the key thing. Um, somewhere here. Grab that bag in the corner. Because every time I come to Wellington, I think about the uh, Civil Defence Get Home ads, I carry a few things with me. I make sure I've got proper walking shoes. I make sure I've got um, a good warm top, a parka, and I bring my survival kit. Should rehearse this, shouldn't I? But that includes a survival bag. You can always make a sheet out of a bag, but it's hard to make a bag out of a sheet. And there's a few other items in there, but this is something I'm not without. Sometimes I don't take the survival kit if I'm on a tame day walk. But I always have a bag. I've used them quite a few times, never for me. Recently I was involved in a workshop for um, senior trainee doctors. And we're talking about what they're going to do if they're told they've got a triage, a backcountry scene where several people have been hurt and the chopper's on its way to pick them up, what are they going to take with them? And I told them the first place to go is the cleaner's cupboard because they'll be, a, they'll be able to get a great big black plastic bag and stick that in their coat pocket. Because if the chopper goes down, and they survive, which is highly probable. Chopper crashes tend to be uh, survivable if you're strapped in and they're not too fast. At least they'll have some shelter and it's readily obtainable. So you've got to be able to get out of the wind. How long can you last without food? Well, I pick most of you would last a month. Me, probably two. So I've got a fair bit of what keeps seals warm. We had a rescue of a guy in the Tarrures once. He'd gone six weeks. He went in with 500 grams of rice. He was very skinny. He was delirious with hunger but he was alive. How did he stay alive? Who said drink water? <laughs> Smart lady. Water's the key to life. Food is optional for a while. But if you're not consuming food, What have you got to do 